Dr. Frazier, I love that. You know, I don't know what to say anymore. Um, thank you, Zynga. And I'm trying to get her to call me Randy, not Miss Weingarten anymore. <laughs> because, yeah, right, never happened, right? Because it's she and her class that taught me so much. Her classmates at Barton, and frankly, the millions of st other students in the United States. It's why we teach. It's why we teach. And thanks to our host, Ed Minnesota, and its terrific president, Denise Speck. And I just want to be able to sing one stanza the way Peggy Flanagan sings and preaches. And thank you to Pastor Paul Slack for those words in a very tumultuous time. And my two partners, without whom we could not do this work, Loretta Johnson, another doctor, Dr. Loretta Johnson, Dr. Frazier, and Mary Catherine Wicker. Thank you. And uh, where is she? She will kill me for this. But there's one more thank you I want to make. So many of you know I try to move heaven and earth to be home Friday nights. But what you might not know is that my other job is that of Rebbitzin, which for those who don't know what that means is the rabbi's wife of the largest LGBTQ synagogue in the world. And thank you, Sharon, for being here today and for everything you do for me. And don't kill me. It's wonderful to celebrate our centennial in Minnesota, a state that's been instrumental in shaping the AFT from our earliest years. But it's a somber time in the Twin Cities as we mourn Philandro Castile. He was a beloved member of the staff at St. Paul's J.J. Hill Montessori School. May his memory be for a blessing. Be it 1916 or 2016, our union occupies a proud place at the intersection of the fight for economic dignity, educational opportunity, worker voice, and civil rights. Each of us have followed our own path to becoming activists in this great union, but we share a common purpose to make a difference through our work, to provide a good life for our families and ourselves, and to create a more just world. My path took some twists and turns, but it started with family. My mom was a second grade teacher. I often think about how hard she fought for her professional latitude in her classroom and a decent paycheck for our family. She didn't start as an activist, you should have heard the conversations around our kitchen table. But that changed when she and her colleagues went on a seven-week strike. Being involved in the union gave them the confidence to fight for the dignity and the power to achieve it. My parents were at the 2008 convention when I was elected AFT president. It's bittersweet because that was the last trip my mom made before she passed away. But it was so moving because I became the president of her union. She, like Zinga, like my colleagues at Clara Barton and my colleagues at the UFT, like Ed McElroy, Charlie Kogan, Al Shanker, Sandy Feldman, like all of you, you are my inspiration. But it's more than inspiration. It's values, 
democracy and fairness, education and economic opportunity, professional voice and agency, racial and social justice for all, values that have endured from generation to generation. I wonder if our founders could have even imagined what their union would have achieved by its centennial. When the AFT was founded in Chicago, In 1916, union headquarters was a spare room in the financial secretary's house. The president lived next door. This was a time in America when women didn't have the right to vote, an America where legislation outlawing lynching was routinely blocked, and Jim Crow meant de facto segregation of schools across the country. Children weren't required to attend school, and child labor was entirely legal. Teachers had to sign yellow doll contracts promising they'd never join a union. Wealth in America was at its most concentrated in history. Americans were still two decades away from a minimum wage. Workers were inhaling asbestos, losing limbs, and dying, dying excuse me, on the job. So much of what we take for granted today took the work of people just like you coming together demanding better. We have done a lot that to our founders would be inconceivable, but we made inevitable. In 1916, we came together. In 1925, the AFT worked with the SLU to defend John Scopes when he was put on trial for teaching Darwin's theory of evolution, and we have fought for academic freedom ever since. In 1932, we helped put an end to yellow dog contracts, and in 1948, we said no more to chartering segregated locals. And in 1956, we expelled all segregated locals from the AFT, even though it meant losing 14% of our members. While the first teachers union strike was in 1946 in St. Paul, Mary Catherine makes sure we know our history. The walkout in 1960 by the United Federation of Teachers sparked a movement that would win collective bargaining for public sector workers across our country. And our lowest wage school employees, Dr. Johnson makes sure we know our history too, our support personnel secured their first contract in 1970. In 1978, when healthcare workers wanted the same voice teachers had, they came to the AFT. And soon after, public employees joined our rights. Today, we empower nurses and therapists, researchers and physicians, scientists and accountants, probation officers and correction officers, and so many more. And our work hasn't been limited to the United States. We've supported Chilean teachers against the Pinochet dictatorship, Polish workers and Solidarność against communism, and South, America, South African teachers against apartheid. That that which was bequeathed to us, we have not squandered. Yellow dog contracts are gone, but we hear their echoes in the intimidation of charter school teachers from Alliance Charters in LA to ICANN schools in Cleveland. We won due process rights, but we're still defending them from people who try to use the courts to strip them away and who think you can fire your way to good schools. And nationally, 
We've been fighting against the misuse of testing and private corporations encroaching into publication and fighting for the education of the whole child. Those of you who were at Cheech last year may remember this formula. That's not a formula. There it is. Remember this? I'll step aside for a second. All those data points fundamentally missed the point, but they were baked into federal education law. Thanks to our work, Race to the Top is over. And no child left behind, gone, gone, gone. And with the passage of ESSA, we got rid of something else the federal government's mandate of standardized tests in teacher evaluations is over. Over. Now, ESSA is a fundamental reset, but the work to make that reset a reality in our classrooms must now begin in earnest, and I know there are some resolutions before this body about how to do that. We took on the largest education corporation in the world, Pearson. And today, here's part of their reality. That's their stock price. But, here's part of our reality, social justice. Decades ago, we championed anti-discrimination protections for the LGBTQ community, including negotiating the first domestic partner benefits in New York in 1993. But even my generation of activists couldn't have envisioned winning marriage equality for same-sex couples. And our founders couldn't have imagined that their vision would grow from eight locals to 3,500 locals to a union of more than 1.6 million members. And I am proud to announce that since our last convention, more than 36 thousand additional members have joined our ranks, bringing the AFT's membership to its highest level ever. Thousands of new members have joined AFT Healthcare, including the Alaska Nurses Association. We've welcomed thousands of higher ed faculty and staff, teachers in charter schools from Buffalo to New Orleans, and members in traditional public schools throughout the South, including Calhoun County, Florida. And now, teachers in every county in Florida have the dignity that comes with a union contract. And in September, we will welcome 24,000 additional members as the result of the merger of the AFT and NEA units of the United Teachers of Los Angeles. People want a union, and the reason is obvious. The union is a vehicle a vehicle that empowers you in your hospital ward, in your classroom, in your communities to promote and protect professionalism, to provide economic security, to develop and deploy solutions at the bargaining table and at the ballot box. A vehicle to fight for civil and human rights and against discrimination in all forms. A vehicle that addresses, rather than stokes, the righteous anger Americans feel and gives them a way to act. Earlier, I mentioned that in 1916, wealth was the most concentrated on record. And that was true until now. 
So, in a time when the wealth gap is growing, union membership is declining, and the middle class is shrinking, when elected officials are destabilizing public schools and public services in order to promote flawed privatization schemes, when a presidential nominee says that wages are too high and that he welcomes a harsh recession because it would benefit him financially, this union, our union, is more necessary than ever before. People are angry, and we get why. It's fear, the fear of being left behind. It's the anxiety of wages that don't rise with expenses, of not knowing whether you can afford college without the burden of crippling debt. It's the feeling many of our millennial members know, the feeling that you've done everything right but are left with lots of debt and not a lot of job prospects. It's worrying whether you'll be able to retire or make your next mortgage payment. And it's the outrage that the top 25 hedge fund managers make more than all kindergarten teachers in the United States combined. The Scott Walkers of the world have exploited this anxiety and turned scapegoating into an art form. They blame professors' salaries for the college debt crisis while they disinvest from higher education. They blame public employees and teacher pensions for draining state budgets while they hand out corporate tax cuts. Donald Trump has taken this brand of politics from dog whistle to bullhorn. In his world, people should blame Mexicans and Muslims for, well, basically everything, from job insecurity to global instability. In our world, that's called racism. We feel the breakneck change taking place, deindustrialization, globalization, the technological, technological revolution. Yet it's met with austerity and polarized politics, which have taken a huge toll on the middle class. No wonder people feel like the economy is rigged and that our politics are broken. But at the AFT, we're not just calling this out, we're taking it on. Because underlying the anger that people are feeling are aspirations for a better life. And those aspirations compel us to act. That's why the AFT helped launch the Wall Take on Wall Street campaign with Senator Elizabeth Warren. And that's why we helped create Hedge Clippers, a campaign that has exposed the hypocrisy of hedge fund managers who try to profit from public employee pensions at the same time they support organizations trying to abolish those very same pensions. Even the Wall Street Journal noticed and put it on its front page. Why, you might ask? Probably because the AFT has become the consumer reports for pension funds, demanding truth and transparency and good returns. And while some of these hedge funders change their practices, others have tried to wipe us out. So if any of them are listening, let me be crystal clear. We will never back down, not from the fight for retirement security and not from the fight against bad actors who want us out of their way. And this is what else the journal noticed. We're using workers' capital for the greater good. 
Since 2014, the AFT has led the way in pulling together $16 billion in pension assets for investment in United States infrastructure. We've created, we've created more than 100,000 jobs in that process and delivered retirees a solid rate of return. That includes, and don't laugh about this, with the Building Trades and the Clinton Global Initiative, the rebuilding of LaGuardia Airport. We promise it will get better. <laughs> this is the power and the potential of a strong labor movement, the power to make real change, shaping solutions in our work sites and in the corridors of power throughout the land. But a union is all of us working together, and member engagement and community involvement are essential. So we've made it a priority to double the number of member activists, triple the number of members who are engaged in union activities, and have conversations with all of our members. And I know many of you are doing this work, and I thank you so much for that work. Thank you very, very much. And community is our new density. Take Arrows, the Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools, Together, we're building a movement that's fighting for strong neighborhood public schools all children deserve. One strategy we've employed is walking in to public schools. Parents, students, educators, and community members, you saw that on the video. And this October, we aim to expand our walk-ins to 200 districts, 2,000 schools, and 100,000 people saying yes to great neighborhood public schools. That's how we challenge and change bad policies. That's how we're going to empower people, fortify our locals, fight tough enemies, and achieve our goals. Just consider the fundamental shifts we've achieved. The end of No Child Left Behind. The delay of the misnamed Cadillac tax, which simply penalized working people's health benefits. Getting tough on for-profit colleges like Corinthian. And we've launched student debt clinics, saving our members and their kids thousands of dollars. An adjunct professor in Miami attended our clinic and reduced her monthly payments from $2,000 a month to $700 a month. She is now a trainer herself, helping others relieve their debt. Just last week, we led a labor alliance petitioning OSHA for a comprehensive workplace violation, excuse me, a comprehensive workplace violence prevention standard to protect healthcare and social service workers. And as the bats in the audience know, we are trying to get NIOSH to address the stress educators increasingly feel. We're fighting TPP and other trade deals that would hurt American workers. And we're playing offense in states as well. Last year, NYSET's fight against Governor Cuomo was one for the ages. And, and this year, as a result, public schools secured $1.5 billion more, including $175 million for community schools. In Connecticut, our state federation won legislation to curb for-profit health care corporations from buying up hospitals as if they were playing Monopoly. And in Oregon, the Oregon Nurses Association won a legislative victory ensuring nurses' final say in hospital staffing so patients receive safe care. And make no mistake, we're fighting back when privatizers and austerity, and austerity hawks put urban school systems in their crosshairs. In Chicago, in Detroit, in Philadelphia, we run in when others have run out. When SUNY Downstate Hospital repeatedly risked closure, and in the City College of San Francisco's fight to keep its accreditation. We're making a difference in McDowell County, West Virginia, the eighth poorest county in the nation. 
and in the 28 districts where our members are creating community schools that are directly addressing the well-being of students and their families. And our Innovation Fund plans to do even more. Then there's Messina in upstate New York, where Erin Koval, our local president, and you'll hear from her later this week, rallied the community and got Alcoa to reverse its decision to close its plant, saving 500 union jobs. And now we're working with the United Steelworkers to keep more manufacturing jobs in the United States. We've partnered with First Book to provide students in need with books of their own and to create classroom libraries. Four million books and counting. Almost one million people you share my lesson, AFT's union-made resource that's available to all educators for free. And our work isn't just in the United States. In Israel, we're fighting bigotry and promoting understanding, partnering with Hand in Hand, one of the few Jewish and Palestinian integrated schools in the Middle East. This work has not just helped our members, it has strengthened our bonds with community, and it has given children a better shot in life. Because for us, it's not about finding a scapegoat. It's about finding a way to help people solve whatever problem is standing in the way. Could you tell my New York accent? <laughs> And one of those problems is the unequal treatment of people of color. We were proud, so proud, when Americans elected our first black president. But many vestiges of separate and unequal treatment remain and, in fact, have gotten worse from the under-resourced and increasingly segregated schools many children of color attend to the 17 states that have restricted voting rights since President Obama's election. My friends, the United States has not come to grips with pervasive racism, not even close. And that shows in the disproportionate use of deadly force against black people. A month after our last convention, Michael Brown was killed. This month, Philando Castile lost his life. Alton Sterling, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, Reckia Boyd, Walter Scott, Trayvon Martin. We will never know all those who could be named. We need more than thoughts and prayers. Our justice system needs to be more just. And we, we must be partners in that work. But it takes more than a legal change or even a change in policing. Our economy and our culture must change too. We're doing this in our own union. After Ferguson, the AFT created our Racial Equity Task Force. You heard Loretta talk about that on the video. Issuing a report on racism and inequality, our report confronts institutional racism and offers concrete steps to create excellent public schools for all students with a focus on boys and men of color. And after the Shanker Institute released a study revealing a sharp decline of black teachers in major cities, 
the U.S. Department of Education answered our call by holding a summit on teacher diversity. And we're also looking at our own biases. We've had tough conversations about race and racism within our own union, about school discipline policies, about the differences between how people of color and white people are treated when stopped by the police or when walking into a store. We need to acknowledge the effects of privilege, the effects of discrimination, and confront them. And now, our Racial Equity Task Force is working with the AFT's Criminal Justice and Public Safety Task Force, building on the belief that communities are safest when all stakeholders, safety personnel and community members alike, are searching for common solutions. Working to make the criminal justice system more just and supporting police are not mutually exclusive. This is a matter of ensuring that everyone feels safe. Those who swear an oath to protect us and those they are sworn to protect. Now, there is another reason that our police and more and more Americans feel unsafe, and that's because America is awash in guns. Three police officers were murdered in Baton Rouge yesterday. Five officers were shot dead as they protected peaceful protesters in Dallas. Forty-nine mostly Latino LGBTQ clubgoers in Orlando, nine churchgoers in Charleston, 26 children and educators in Newtown. One of the Baton Rouge officers, Montrell Jackson, a 32-year-old African-American and new dad, posted these words on Facebook before his death, and I quote, I swear to God I love the city, but I wonder if the city loves me. In uniform, I get nasty, hateful looks, and out of uniform, some consider me a threat. These are trying times. Please don't let hate infect your heart." End quote. There are 33,000 gun deaths in the United States each year. The Second Amendment is the law of the land, but the NRA's interpretation of it is not. Should it really be easier to buy an assault weapon than to get a driver's license or register to vote? We are better than this. We must never accept that mass murder or indiscriminate killing are the new normal. Never. And, and, we must call out the hypocrisy of elected officials who offer their condolences after gun violence in one breath and defend civilians' right to own weapons of war in the next. Next month, as part of the commemorations of the March on Washington, the AFT will demonstrate with clergy LGBTQ and other civil rights activists on the National Mall to end gun violence. And that leads me to one more challenge. The rights of LGBTQ people for whom inclusion is a matter of safety. That's why we've spoken out against the bathroom bills and other forms of discrimination. And why some of the bathrooms in this convention hall are gender neutral. We have, we have transgender students, members, friends, and family. 
So, just like you embraced a lesbian as your president in 2008, let's make sure our transgender colleagues can come out of the shadows too. This fight, as I can see in this hall, this fight to disarm hate is a righteous fight and worth every bit of blood, sweat, and tears we can exert. Our ability to make our values a reality depends on exercising our strength at the ballot box and the bargaining table. When unions are strong, we set a standard that helps all workers. Union members earn higher wages and are likely to have pensions and employer-provided health benefits. And one of the strongest predictors of how well your children will do economically is the percentage of union members in your community. So no surprise that Tom Perez, the Secretary of Labor, recently said, and I quote, the more you strengthen collective bargaining, the more you strengthen the middle class. But it's also not surprising that a right to bargain is in the right wing's crosshairs. Just remember Friedrichs and how the right tried to use the Supreme Court to decimate us. Sometimes, in the age of privatization of austerity, our victories are hanging on to what we have. But bargaining holds the potential to transform and to innovate. New York's Chancellor's District was a case in point. In the late 1990s, rather than closing struggling schools, the reflexive reform of the deformers, we turned them around. We negotiated for higher salaries, research-based strategies, and yes, lots and lots and lots of resources for smaller class sizes, a common curriculum aligned with high standards, teacher planning time, and student tutorial time. And what did that produce? Sustained student achievement gains in high poverty neighborhood schools. <laughs> UFT continues to innovate in bargaining. Under the PROS program, staff members at 200 PROS schools, by the way, more PROS schools than charters in New York City. They have designed programs ranging from promoting teacher intervisitation and peer review, changing student to teacher ratios to allow for small group learning, and increasing student integration. I see those yellow shirts. The Baltimore Teachers Contract paid educators more for creating programs that meet student needs. Teachers have developed a green leaders program that transforms learning environments into green spaces and supports the growth of urban, urban farms near schools. And sometimes what we win for our members sets a standard for entire communities. In 2014, the graduate teaching fellows of the University of Oregon went on strike when the university refused to provide paid sick days. They won paid sick days for themselves, and soon after, the Oregon legislature required paid sick leave for all workers, followed by California and New York. And last month, HPAE members at Bergen Regional Medical Center won contract language that will make them safer. The facility in New Jersey had been cited by OSHA for multiple incidents of violence against healthcare workers. Our union won increased health and safety training and adherence to OSHA standards and a healthy pay increase and better staffing. Likewise, the Washington State Nurses Association won a big victory protecting rest breaks for nurses. Both the UTLA and the Toledo Federation have used many tools. Oh my God, I know Toledo is here and I know UTLA is here. They've used many tools, member and community engagement and political power, to win impressive CBAs. In LA, they won a 10% salary increase and their first ever contract language on class size and counselors to student ratios. 
and Toledo went a 13.5% salary increase and secured additional teacher leaders to deliver peer-to-peer -peer professional development, and they negotiated a paraprofessional to teacher career ladder program. And just a few weeks ago, the members of New York's Public Employees Federation vote, voted in record numbers for a contract that retains employee health benefits, raises salaries, and provides funds for their committees and programs. Every victory ripples out beyond us, strengthens community, and strengthens our country. And this gets to my last point, which is when it comes to strengthening our country, nothing we do this year matters more than who we elect to be our mayors, our legislators, and our president. Walter Ruther from the UAW said it best. There's a direct relationship between the ballot box and the bread box, and what the union fights for and wins at the bargaining table can be taken away in the legislative halls. So take what happened here in Minnesota when voters elected Governor Mark Dayton. He's been a great friend of working people, boosting the minimum wage, investing in public education, and supporting workers' rights. He shepherded this state after a great recession and turned Minnesota's budget deficit into a $2 billion surplus. Okay, right next door is Governor Scott Walker. He slashed funding for public schools and universities, eliminated workers' rights, and Wisconsin's budget deficit has increased to $2 billion. Neighboring states, opposite directions, elections matter. Now, with Citizens United, which we are trying to get changed, and it takes the Supreme Court to do that. But with Citizens United, we can't possibly outspend our opponents, but we can outwork them, and we can outorganize them, and we do. We've won against billionaires, ideologues, and political attack dogs. But in my lifetime, we've never faced anything like we're facing this year. What do you call it when a candidate for president debases an entire religion, mocks a disabled reporter, refers to women as pigs, and calls Mexicans rapists? I call it a threat to civil society, to decency, and to the values that underpin our country, and frankly, and frankly, it is perilously close to fascism. You've heard his insults so repeatedly that maybe it's drowned out his education ideas. Well, he, and I quote, loves the poorly educated. So, no surprise, he pledged to cut education spending way, way down. But really, encouraging single mothers to take out exorbitant loans to attend Trump University? <laughs> Donald Trump exploits people's anger to further divide an already polarized country, and he does so with gravely disturbing glee. Let's remember, we are a nation of immigrants. My own grandparents came from the Ukraine to escape oppression. The way Trump talks about Muslims and Mexicans is all too reminiscent of the way Jews and Italians were talked about in the 1930s. He uses the kind of talk that evokes the fear 
that led to the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. The horror in Nice reminds us that the world must be united in condemning and acting against terror, but that is far different from condemning an entire religion or barring refugees because they are Muslim. The snake oil he's selling will make economic inequality even worse. He has assiduously courted working class voters, but his proposals will leave them in even worse shape. He says he's against trade deals that would send jobs overseas, but where does he manufacture his own products? Sweatshops in Bangladesh, China, and Mexico. He bankrupted his businesses four times, and while he boasts that he was unscathed, his employees, contractors, and vendors were devastated. His tax plan, his tax cut plan for the rich would add $30 trillion to the deficit. And he'd end Dodd-Frank, letting the big banks go back to the kind of legalized gambling that wrecked our economy. Thankfully, on the other side, we have Secretary Hillary Clinton. Now, when Hillary graduated from Yale Law School, she chose to work at the Children's Defense Fund. She took on what in that era was a dangerous assignment, working undercover in Alabama to expose the continuation of segregated schools after Brown versus Board of Education. As First Lady of Arkansas, Hillary advocated for early childhood education, children's health care, public education, and juvenile justice reform, and she's never stopped. As First Lady of the United States, after losing the fight for universal health care, she entered the fray again to help create the Children's Health Insurance Program through which 8 million kids get health coverage every year. And she's always leaned into the fights for women and girls. Indeed, while Donald Trump was having his ties made in China, Hillary was challenging Chinese authorities, telling them women's rights are human rights. Now, I'll never forget the moment, and some of you know this already, that I went from supporter to believer. After 9-11, Hillary made it her mission to get those first responders and emergency personnel the health care they needed. Her compassion, her tenacity, and her belief in the power of government to improve people's lives, those qualities were front and center in that fight. Since then, she's proved time and again that she is a dreamer and a doer. And while I don't think anyone should vote for her just because she's a woman, I know from experience that to achieve what she has is harder because she is a woman. And give me, the men in the room, give me this point of personal privilege. How many of us in this audience have been told, you sound shrill, don't yell, or you're not smiling enough. <laughs> that listening is a sign of weakness. We know. Thank you, men in the room. <laughs> and I want to say something about Bernie Sanders. This is the first generation of young people in our history that might be worse off than the generation before. That can make people feel hopeless and helpless. Mm -hmm. But Bernie inspired his supporters to act, and that's been a great gift. And 
I was there just last week at the platform committee. Bernie and his supporters worked with us to make the Democratic Party platform the most progressive in American history. Proof positive that we are stronger together. Bernie's right. His words, not mine. Hillary is far and, best, far and away the best candidate for president. Indeed, as President Obama has said, she is the most qualified person to be nominated for president in our lifetime. Hillary understands the most urgent issues confronting our country. Her bold economic plan puts unions front and center. She will level the playing field for the middle class, raising incomes for hardworking families, creating debt-free college for students, and lifting children out of poverty. She is ready to assume the solemn responsibility of keeping Americans safe from violence and terrorism. And in health care, public services, and public education, she has our back. This, my friends, and it will be up to you, the Executive Council does resolutions for the primary, but the members of this convention do it for the general election. But this, my friends, is a moment of reckoning for our country, a battle for its soul and for our kids' future. So for these and so many other reasons, the only choice in this election is Hillary Clinton. Let's give her a great reception later on. So earlier, I talked about our values and the pathways we've taken to fight for them. Democracy and fairness, education and economic opportunity, professional voice and agency, racial and social justice for all. Values that have endured over the course of our history, generation to generation. Of course, there will always be threats, challenges, and setbacks. So while the path is never easy, we should heed the words of Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But it doesn't bend on its own. We bend it year after year, fight after fight, election after election, by acting on the values that we've held so close for the past hundred years. This union is our vehicle in this journey for justice. It was that vehicle in 1916, it is today, and because of you, it will be in the century ahead. Thank you, AFT.